Hey everybody, I'm Kim Holderness. And I'm Ben Holderness. <laughs> and, and welcome to the Holderness Family Podcast in two different locations. Yes, this is our um, first time podcasting from afar. This is our special edition Amazing Race Season 23 Leg 6 Recap Podcast. That's a lot you of words. What? We've got to simplify the title. But, but by the uh, time that's, that's by the time we day. figure out a title change, we're going to be done. Um, right. So Penn is on a dude's ski trip. I'm very jealous, um, but he's coming home today. We miss you very yeah. much. Babe, I miss you too. I'm just going to show you something so that you don't get as jealous. Okay. I'm going to show you the weather currently in Telluride. Oh, yeah. Um, that's for, a big no for me. That's a for big those no. Of, yeah. <laughs> for those of you, that's uh, maybe backwards, but for those of you who are uh, not on our video portion of this, it's minus eight. It is minus eight. Right so thank minus you. Eight. If you're listening to where you normally get your podcast, thank you so much. And subscribing, it totally helps. If you're watching this on our YouTube vlog channel, we welcome you. Um, but, but guy, I have to point out, we did get artwork. I just, <laughs> we're the type of people that order things and then just let them lean against the wall for a good six months. So this... It's Corsica. I was going to comment on that. Yeah, you, this so is you're Corsica. Al, you're, you're almost there. Or okay, almost there. But like on that. Yeah, and then we won't actually hang it up until people come to visit us. That's the type of people we are. Um, I'll do it when I get home. Uh, will you, though? We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I will. We'll no, see. I can hang. I have a limited amount of skills. I'm the opposite. I have, I'm like Liam Neeson. I have a specific set of skills, but it's not a good thing. It's like only one or two things that I can do. Okay. You can do a lot of things. Okay. Yeah. Let's get to it. Let's get to a recap. Pre-race mood. The mood going into this. Um, <laughs> you were introduced in this episode of Leg 6 to the new Kim. This is the new Kim. You've heard me talk about since like just kind of, I just have to pretend to be a person that's mentally stable. Like I have to think to myself, what would somebody who's not anxious and depressed do? And literally I have to pretend like I'm that person. This is the moment that that started. This is, yeah, this I, is the life moment that started that whole push. And we should give people a little bit of context. Um, this was, we had gotten on a plane and traveled, but really we weren't too far removed from you jumping off of that bridge. Right. Um, and remember it's, it wasn't just about that moment of you mustering up the courage to do that, which obviously was like one of the highlights of the season for, for me to watch you do that. But it's what comes with it afterwards. It's what, mm -hmm. what baggage you take from that jump. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, like, I love that you just decided um, in a very positive move to fundamentally change your personality, um, which I, it was a little bit like we can both admit that's a little bit of a joke. Right. But also really what it was to me was a commitment from you uh, to like lean into this adventure and try to make the most out of it. And that can be so hard for someone uh, who is dealing with all of the baggage that comes from a very anxious stunt that you had just pulled off. So I was like, I, I laughed a little bit when you saw me on the screen doing it, but I was so proud of you for taking that route. Well, thank you. Your children got a hearty laugh. Like I had to <laughs> oh, hit pause. You They're like, I'm the new Kim. I'm not going to stress out and be angry. Whatever it is I said, they, they, I had to pause. I'm like, guys, we're missing the show. They're like, Everybody new Kim, paused. new yeah. Kim. Um, because, um, and we won't dwell on this, but I had an emotional breakdown after we got back to the hotel, after that Lugana, like, like I had gotten us lost. Like we were in the lead and then it got us so turned around. Like my, my mom thinks that I had a concussion. Maybe I had the worst headache. Maybe I did. I mean, it was a pretty significant fall, but I was like, this isn't working. Whatever this, like, I'm such a stress case. You know, we were so prepared coming into this and I'm such, such a stress cake. It wasn't working. So I will also say we thought at leg six, there's six teams left. We just assumed there'd be a U-turn in this leg. We're all friends. You know, everybody's like, we, we have this charter flight experience. The charter flight, by the way, so dreamy, but they don't tell you where you're going. So we board a flight and we are, we're all looking out the window and we're with our compasses and there's no map. There's no like, maps there's no, on the it's plane. It's not like you're on Delta where they have like a map and we could figure out, Oh, well, we're going Southwest. I'd like, I didn't know enough about Switzerland to know where we were going. Right. So, I mean, we had our compasses out. We're looking, we saw we were landing on an Island. Um, and then it wasn't until we get an immigration that we see a French flag and Penn speaks French. So I was like, sweet. So we're leaving in the second departure group. Mm -hmm. We're assuming there's a U-turn coming. I, our plan was we were not going to use a U-turn until, unless we were in the back of the pack. Um, but we also weren't going to hold a grudge against somebody who U-turned us. I just assumed we were going to get U-turned. So I was like, if this is our last day on the race, 
we're in this beautiful island country and let's just enjoy it. So that was the new Kim. So I also just, I, I want to go back for one minute before we get started. Yeah. And cause you keep talking about how you changed your, your fundamentally changed your personality. And I was talking a lot about what you had done the two days before my cousin, Lorinda, oh, who yeah. is kind of a genius. She's a therapist. You, yeah. So she texted you um, after the race and she said, I've never seen anybody disassociate in real time before. Mm-hmm. And that was a term that we, we like, neither of us are even familiar with uh, that we've since learned about, but I guess that that is a thing that you can do when, when there is trauma in your life. And her belief was that you had actually disassociated. And then when you had to reassociate, that's where the challenge really comes in. So, I mean, maybe that was like you fundamentally, quote unquote, changing your uh, personality um, helped you kind of ease back into the reality of what was going on. And the truth is, I mean, the reality was we were not in first place. We were in third place. We were in the second group. Um, You know, we could see the people who were in last. Mm -hmm. And that's always a stressor for me. Um, And I know it's a stressor for you, too. So that mindset was great. Now, let me tell you my favorite part of the first part of the race and where my pregame mood immediately altered for the first time in several episodes, no one handed me keys to a car. Okay. That's, that's very real. So we're, I did not want to drive. We were leaving in 15 minute increments, which in the last leg, there was like on the people who did it best. Like we did a great job driving to the actual location and it was a four and a half hour Throughout the day, we had driven like four and a half hours, 15 minutes in the new world of COVID procedures and how you have to interact with people. 15 minutes is pulling over and stopping one time. It takes a long time because of like, there's a whole system to ask for directions. And it's a, that's 15, that's nothing in a four and a half hour day. We weren't driving. Driving is, navigating is the hardest part of this race. Mentally, it is the most taxing part. uh, Even when you do it well. Um, Yeah. But it was like, well, crap, that is our advantage. So yeah. 15 minutes, if everybody is a, a, like has a level playing field, I was freaked out a little bit. Like I oh, wanted you yeah. to drive. And I'm sorry about, I'm sorry that you were freaked out, but I'm just going to go into my personal headspace here for a second. Um, yeah. You know, just in case you want to know, um, they don't show a lot of this on the race. I hate driving through Europe. I don't want to drive through Europe. Um, it's the, everyone is a better driver than me. The only thing I can do is screw up. There's, I, I can't be a hero when I'm driving. No. It's impossible for me to be a hero. I want to be a hero like out on an obstacle course or something. And so every day they hand me the keys and the only thing I can do is something wrong. It's a lot of pressure. It made our armpit sweat. And I think what it is, is like navigating without GPS in a foreign country in which, you know, they're speaking in different languages, you know, the signs are in different, it, they could ask you to park your car and tie your shoes after that, and it seems overwhelming. So, we, the reason we had a driver this leg, and we were surprised, the roads are so treacherous. Like, there, and there's an extra YouTube clip, and it shows, like, that thing I had around my neck, um, like, I pull it over my eyes, because I'm not exaggerating, you know, we, like, sometimes, you know, we do things for flair. This is, they did this because it was unsafe. It's unsafe for normal humans to drive. You're driving up into the mountains and it's like the roads are this wide. The, the, um, the roads are this wide and the cars are this wide. And you are literally like, if you opened the car window, you're going down a mountain and then like the rocks are it. It was very treacherous. So if you need, if you got screwed up, you needed to back down, like you would die. So that's why they had drivers on this leg of the race. And I wish they had drivers on every leg of the race. I know. I, say. I it's know. Like I, so you have, Kim, you have like a certain amount of energy that you can put into certain things before you flood and mm-hmm. you're and you and you kind of it, it felt like 90 percent of my energy for the majority of this race was put into not screwing up while I was driving. I know. I know. And well, was, me and me, too. It's very tense because I'm navigating from the back seat and I get car sick. I do believe there is advantages to being in the second group and this particular leg. We were in, we see Lulu, Lala, Ryan, and Dusty rip open their clue, and we're standing back a little bit, but we saw them run into cars. We're like, oh, we're not driving. Okay, great. So where we were placed with um, Raquel and Kayla and uh, Sherry and Akbar, you know, you're kind of down into this, like there's, I mean, 
how do I describe it? Because we were down probably like five or six feet down like this rocky path. Sure. Well, I mean, you saw Phil um, introducing us kind of flying over the top of that bridge of that mm-hmm. old fort. We were underneath the bridge. So we were underneath the bridge. So we had to climb yeah. up to the roadway. Yes. No, And we were in second place knowing we're in the second group knowing. So we rip open the clue and it's like, drive, 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 drive. okay, just go. Like I did not read the clue great. All I knew is we needed to get to the cars. So we just started running up the hill and you see Sherry and Akbar do the responsible thing and they stand there and read the entire clue. I, I read it. I was like, okay, go. So we were able to get <laughs> to our car first. Tomas, I remember him. I wrote him down in my notes because I have a like a real love affair with uh, Tomas was our driver. Huge Michael Jordan fan, by the way. I know. So when he learned yeah. where we were from, we just talked about Michael Jordan the whole time. I think Ryan Dusty Lulu Lala said they hit some traffic on the way to the Belvedere, that big tower. We hit a little bit, but not as bad as they did because, okay, go ahead. Point of order. We, a lot of times when we're on this race, we have people t- like telling us that they hit traffic or that something didn't work or that something broke down. Do you ever feel like they exaggerate that just a little bit? We do too, though. I know. No, I'm absolutely saying we need to. Do you feel like that? That's an everything. As I'm that saying, every everything racer makes. Yeah, everything feels so heightened. Like yeah. if we we did hit like a minor traffic jam, but it, maybe we it's did. the and, same one that and, Lulu and, But it hit. felt like, and, and if someone asks us, we would we're say, like we were there for we thirty minutes. Huge. I feel like that's human nature on this race to kind of like handicap yourself. Well, when you're it, trying to tell stories it, to other races. Yeah, and you know, because we you know kind of share worse stories afterwards. So here's another advantage. It was the big deal was made to us, you know, because they have to explain the rules of the race was that if you leave your bag anywhere other than you can, you can ditch your bag. If you can see Phil on the race course, you can put your bag down anywhere else you leave it. It becomes, you lose it. Like you lose it. Like it's property of the course. So in a self-drive, we felt always very confident that we'd be driving to the next place. So we ditched our bags unless the clue specifically said like, park the car, take your bags with you. It would say that we're about to have to go find this next clue. We see Lulu, Lala, Dusty Ryan come down, jumping back into their cars with their packs. And I was like, oh, ditch your pack. They're getting back into the car. So we felt safe leaving our pack. Kayla brought hers because I think she was still nervous about it, but it allowed us, you know, I saw them. I was surprised they were walking up that hill. We sprinted and it was, it was a ton of stairs. My quads were on fire still from that one in Lugano, but it allowed us to move so much faster. You remember the creepy cat on the way up? No. Oh, there was a really, like, I, you have these little things that you remember from the race and, yeah. and you, it didn't show up in the in the footage but we went by this cat and the cat was just sitting there staring right at me just a cat like on the on the edge like but so i'm staring at the cat like what is this i'm adhd on the cat and then you show you they shows me look at the sign that says belvedere yeah it was because i stopped to look at the cat oh see the cat was like our spirit guide and well do you remember like is that we were looking for a sign in this crazy and, and i'm not a cat person us. Everyone, everyone who knows me well knows I'm not a cat person, <laughs> but I feel like I owe a debt of gratitude to this to creepy, French wild, feral cat, French cat. Okay. shot, if you will, that was like staring at me. So, so um, you know what? I'm here to add some color. That's yes. Right. Right. Um, Please continue. We get to the top of this, the, this tower and it was a lot of stairs, you know, and it's one of those things they can't show it all, but it was very, it was grueling, but we didn't have our packs so we could move faster. We rip open the detour clue and it's mule please or say cheese. Um, as a general rule coming in, we did not want to work with animals, but as you've seen, we had this, we had a big plan coming into this race. We're never going to do the judge task. Like we've right. exclusively done the judge test. Like we've just like we've taken the plan and it's just thrown it out and it's never worked. We've just well, been terrible. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree, but I think what we did on this day was we imagined the worst case scenario for each one. Mm-hmm. And we took the least worst case scenario. Like that was, that was our, they showed some of our thought process in the car, but it started with our hard, fast rule that we're not going to work with animals and we're not going to do judges. But then remember what the conversation drifted to, like, doesn't cheese sit around for a long time? And I don't know if they had much of that on the on the footage, but we're like, like she yeah, cheese takes a while to make. So here's a tweet <laughs> from Sandy Noble. Mm-hmm. You would think making cheese would be a breeze, B R I 
BS. Get it, Breeze. I love a good, I love a good punny joke. Um, love a good dad and, joke. But this is the advantage of not having to drive because it, normally we would have just like gotten to the car and then we would have been sweating about finding the next place and not really had time to read the clue. The, the drive offered us the time to reread think about it, have a conversation. And yeah, Penn, you were the one that said, cheese need, that's a, you can't just make cheese. No. Cheese, that sounds terrible. In fact, cheese gets better when, when it it's just old. sits around, like outside of your refrigerator. I, I don't know if you people know this, but like if there's a bunch of like mold and crap on your cheese, you can just cut it off and keep eating it. I don't think that's true. Okay. <laughs> It's not like we get to see the video options of what it looks like on these detours. Right. We have to go by the clues. I do think, except for Scotland with the singing and dancing, we have chosen the detours that have either been more time consuming or physically tasking, taxing. And Lugano, because we always said like, we will do the physical task because we can just muscle it out. That was like, you can't even argue. It was like physically harder. Like, we just weren't, we, we realized in that car ride, we need to throw out the plan and just make a good decision in the moment because nothing, it had not been working for us. And here's the other thing. There's that moment of realization, like, Ooh, I got the right one or Ooh, I got the wrong one when it comes to a detour. And everyone has it. Sometimes you had that realization, like three days later, right. sometimes some people probably have it when they're watching the edit of the show. We have to park the car because these roads are so wonky. Like you have to take an even smaller car to get up. We get in this blue Jeep and we um, go up the hill and it's like, it is straight up. It's straight up like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, Penn, you're like, you pick the mule. If if it's one of those, like you have to copy or you're looking at an example task. Like I always wanted to pick next to the example right mm -hmm. so i picked the one that was the the mule that was right next to like the example the model mule as you called it um and i think that helped us it his name was duke we have a funny tweet uh, duke a fitting name for a team from raleigh durham area once we so pen cheers for unc so he's a Tar Heel fan. And if you're from this area, you know, there's like a big rivalry. So that was a lot of the discussion. And I was like, you will cheer for Duke if we're in a race. So that's why he's saying, go Duke, go Duke. I need to make a, a point of order here. Um, you were just mentioning go Duke. I watched this episode with a bunch of my friends who I'm on vacation with, as Kim mentioned before this. Uh, they're all huge Carolina fans. I'm a huge Carolina fan. Uh, even though I went to the University of Virginia, my granddad played basketball at UNC. So yelling, go Duke, and I made this clear on the way down the mountain was very uncomfortable for me. I understand why the Amazing Race didn't want to show that because like, not everybody's going to care. Who cares? Yeah. Oh my, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yelling, go Duke. That may have been the biggest challenge of the race for me. <laughs> So I told him like, you're going to love Duke. Okay. Um, I have to say, I, I think we gotten it an advantage by being, we, we kind of positioned ourselves next to the example. I was very nervous because Duke was so big, so big that you kept calling him a horse. And let me read a tweet from Jessica Lease, who <laughs> does the Rob has a podcast uh, recaps. Penn may have studied a lot of things before going on the amazing race, but animal identification is not one of them. Apparently hashtag. That's not a horse. He kept saying, okay, we got the horse thing. I'm like, it's a mule. It's a mule. He's like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm like, it's a mule. And so I got kept correcting him. And um, obviously they put in like four times you calling it a horse. That was very funny. Well, subjectively, it looked a lot like a horse. Like it, the rest it, of them looked like mules. I think they may have accidentally given us a horse. They, that was the biggest mule I've ever seen. It, if that was, It was mule. very concerning to me because I was like, oh, I mean, they, the term stubborn as a mule is like a real thing. So I'm like a bigger mule who's stubborn is going to be a pain in the butt. But he was great. And so that's why we're chanting, um, go Duke. The path, we had to walk like down a path that was maybe like, what, a quarter of a mile? It was not long. Um, no. and, and then you you take um, the, you know, goat's milk to the, how do you, the cheese maker. The milksman. The milks. The, the cheeseman. I don't know. Like the person, yeah. very kind the, man. And yep. he gave us a clue and we were in first place and everybody, everybody was there. There's got to be something said about passing people right in front of them. Okay. I love all of these people that we have raced with, but as far as psychology, which is a big part of the race, just mowing past the two people who are in front of us when they weren't even 
frankly, they were not close to getting finished with their task. Um, not only did it feel good to, to be in first place, but I think equally on the other side of the equation, it had to feel equally bad for them. Oh, That's I not mean, necessarily the, a bad thing for us. The task was, I mean, you couldn't even argue it. Like Raquel and Kayla, it took them an extra, I don't even know how long, like 15 minutes, I think they said to figure out that their thing was upside down. So it was attention to detail. You're dealing with an animal, but it was, you couldn't even argue that it was faster. But we did have to like run straight up a hill for a couple minutes. It's fine. So we get in our little Jeep. We go back and um, we go down like we go down into this mountain. Um, I will say like we can take a minute to talk about um, the the drama is that, you know, this episode was really about Ryan and Dusty. <laughs> They, um, they're rightfully lowest, so. Yeah, it was because it was a great storyline. Their their lowest placement had been team number two. I think in the beginning, you hear him say like, "Oh, I'm a tomcat knocking these birds out of a nest," something like that. So Ryan and Dusty were very confident. Um, I think, it, like Dusty especially, um, and they had every right to be because they had been first or second every single leg. They're not to me the typical male male team that you see on this race because I do think they balance each other well because sometimes it's yeah. like testosterone overload but if you watch any of the extra clips like Raquel and Kayla last week like I would say they're clack like dusty like he you know I, I would tell him this to his face like he was very confident very confident and so that's why everybody was like oh dang because they were so confidence is something I struggle with. Like even in first place, I'm like, oh, it's fine. We just got lucky. Like they were very, very confident. So there was like a little bit of, you know, some drama there. The drama was justified and the storyline is what it should have been. Because as you said, uh, Dusty and Ryan are very interesting. If you mm -hmm. were to look at Ryan's like mental state, it is a flat line. Oh my it gosh. is just a straight line going across from one side of the page to the he other. He just never and, gets above this. And I just, yeah. I, I want him to teach a master class. Yeah. Right. D Dusty is a roller coaster. Yeah. He absolutely is a roller coaster. We saw him that morning of the race and he was at the top of that roller coaster. Um, we saw him at the bottom of the roller coaster. And at the end of the race, we saw him back on top of the roller coaster. And every single minute of that journey, um, he is wearing that on his sleeve. Yeah. So he's, he's very emotional and open about it. I kind of love it. Mm -hmm. um, I love the dynamic of those two guys. That's why I think they absolutely commanded so much screen time and should have had it on this particular leg. But again, I think that that we kind of pushed them off the top of the roller coaster when we blew past them on the way to this next challenge. We get to the roadblock and it's, you know, who wants to make a splash? I had wanted to do anything swimming. I love to swim. Penn is a foot taller than me, but I'm a faster swimmer than he is. I grew up in Florida. Like I love swimming in open waters. Like my, I love it. It's my favorite thing. So I didn't pack a bathing suit necessarily on this race, but like I wanted to do the swim and it said who wanted to make a splash. That's why you see me kind of going like, okay, you do it because I thought it might be a swimming thing, but we were in the mountains. So I didn't really know yeah. how that had worked. And I didn't, I was like, I don't want to jump off another mountain. I don't want to jump off another thing. Well, uh, I mean, I know that you thought that this was a fun looking challenge. I'm going to show you how much actual swimming there was. You ready? <laughs> okay. One stroke, two strokes. That was it. We, there was, it was more climbing and jumping. Bumba! Woo! Oh, Amidst all of these like crazy, like natural water slides and cannonballs, there's a clue somewhere. Watching that, I 1000% want to go back and I want to do this because yeah. it looked so beautiful and fun. But it was, you know, we did a Zoom um, after the show yesterday. We missed you, Penn. But Arun and Akbar were talking about like how it actually was very grueling. Like talk, talk to us about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you heard me say I felt like I was on spin cycle. Um, the There is no one gets out of that unscathed unless you are a 22 year old Olympic athlete. Or I mean, Ryan. <laughs> Well, I mean, even, I mean, I talked to him about it. He, he, everyone had bruises. It's, I mean, it, it is like those slides that they show, it's not plastic, like a water slide you go down. It's rock, it's granite or whatever the heck the rock is in Corsica. Mm -hmm. And these like tiny little movements, you feel, you feel no, you know, there's absolutely no give on anything. Um, <clears throat> getting to the top of the hill was challenging. It, it wasn't too dissimilar. <clears throat> sorry, it wasn't too dissimilar 
from Switzerland, we had to go up and down to that uh, kind of six country viewing spot. Mm-hmm. And it like they didn't show a lot of that. But it, by the time we got to the top, everyone was pretty gassed. And obviously, it affected Akbar on his way up. On the way down, there were a lot of these jumps and you you couldn't see how deep the water was and you would land in the water and be like, oh, bleep, this is not very deep. Mm -hmm. I had one slide that you kind of slide and then you disappear off the edge and then you land in this water and you don't see the water on the way down. And the water was only about maybe a foot and a half deep and my knees weren't ready for it. And I hyperextended my left knee. Mm. I've got some scar tissue from a torn MCL and a torn meniscus from when we were in New York hunting like 10 Mm -hmm. years ago. And, uh, and it, I felt it very much at that point. I actually like on the way out, I told Akbar, like, dude, just be careful of this one slide. Cause I was worried that it was going to hurt him and uh, Akbar and I had developed kind of a relationship at that point. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, okay. I'm, I'm giving you all the bad stuff. It was stunningly beautiful. Like yeah. everything else on the amazing race, the final zip line looked like a lot of fun. I was the first one to go. And if you watch the second and third and fourth people, I think they told him to turn around on the way down. Uh huh. They didn't tell me to do that. So I don't know if you could tell. Does anyone know what a crotch plant is? <laughs> no. It's it's when you're like spread eagle on the way, like going down. Uh, and then there's not much of in, And then you go from being here to just dumping down because the weight takes over. And the first thing to hit the water was my testicles. <laughs> um, I'm just telling you that right now. And it was That's really warm water. Term. No, no. Uh, No, it was cold water. Thank God for the wetsuit and the extra padding. But (laughs) I'm telling you, (laughs) that hurt. It really, really hurt. And so your poor testicles. Every everybody else turned around. Like Ryan, when Ryan did it, he looked like he. I mean, I I think it's possible that Ryan worked at the circus at some point. I mean, I don't. Um, I the yeah. Um, That really that really hurt. I had to take a second. Like they obviously aren't showing a lot of my old man injuries on the main broadcast. I'm trying to be like go with the flow, Kim. But my something that calms me is just like writing notes. And so at some point, I will share my notes with you people. But I was keeping track of when everybody was getting there versus when you left, like how Mm -hmm. long it was taking. I want to know how long it was taking us to do something versus them for no reason, like for no reason. But uh, Lulu Lala were there and then Kayla and um, Raquel showed up not, not, not too soon after. And they were both like, oh, Ryan and Dusty, Ryan and Dusty, Ryan and Dusty. The whole time I was like, you guys. Ryan and Dusty, could you turn themselves, which is what they did. They, you turned yeah. themselves and they're going to be fine. Um, okay. So my baby gets out of there. He's booking it. He's like, he's running. Um, and he gets through so quickly because he's my baby. Um, we opened the clue and it says we had to kayak up the river, up this river to find pill. pill. I'm tired. Phil I love at Pill. Phil Kogan. at our our uh, next pit pit stop, and we, you know, 19 months before we were pretty confident we were in first place in Scotland. This is the first time we had been in first place in 19 months, and I was psyched. I'm like, we can't lose this. I mean, I didn't know how long you know Lulu and Lala were going to take, um, Raquel and Kayla. I think I said in there that I'd not blown up so like so much as a beach ball. I've blown up like an air mattress, but it was like a, an electric thing, an electric yeah. thing. I yeah, I mean, so some people are like, "How do you escape parenting?" Because I just I find ways to not do that stuff, guys. I blow up a bike tire, and that's about it. Um, it wasn't complicated. You had to just use the right attachment. We got that done pretty quickly. But here. <laughs> was our first fight on the amazing race and there is bonus footage where i don't think they show they obviously can't show it in the entirety but it's on the amazing race youtube channel i think the title of it is called like stomach alien or something so we're like cranking we're, right. you know we we get our kayak and we're you have to go up this like up this hill and to launch it into we're going up a, you know we had to paddle up a river which is hard Mm-hmm. And you see the only clip you see and you have to kind of look is Penn, who is six foot five, 200 pounds, lying flat on his back in the kayak. Tell right. us, That's... tell us, friend, what was happening. All right. So 
I've had this hernia that I've just been living with for maybe five or six years. And it's right in the middle of my stomach. I've talked to doctors about it. It, it, if I'm like reaching over to tie my shoes for too long and I strain the wrong way, or like most often when I'm trying to move something up a staircase, yeah, uh, it's, it just pops out and I have to stop whatever I'm doing, lay completely flat and just jam that thing back uh... into my heart. Kim, you've seen it in I action. I know. Right? We, like, we were pulling. We were pulling. I think these chairs up the stairs, like yeah. when this like finished attic space appear, right. and he would he, we, he was pulling it up, and I was pushing it up, and yeah. I saw, and it looks like an alien popping out. Yeah. And, so a yeah. lot of people listening are going to say, "Why don't you get surgery on that?" And the answer is, it's like a, it's like a three month haze, and you just can't do anything for three months. And I can't not do anything for three months. So the doctor's like, "Can you manage it?" And I'm like, "Yeah, like all right, well, that's just something that you and your crappy body is going to live with until <laughs> the day that you die, which is what happens when you turn 45 and you go to a doctor." Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, the hernia was happening, and I was trying to explain it to you, and you can see it all on the YouTube. <laughs> and you're like, you're in the you're in the, I'm going to get this done mode. Um, and I'm just trying to explain to you that I'm having a medical condition. But at some point, you're you're telling me that I'm rowing the wrong way. You were. I, well, I don't have the energy to tell you. And I still haven't had the energy to tell you. And I want you to go back and look at the clip. We can't row on opposite sides or we're going to hit each other's oar. So, okay, you tell your side, I'll tell my side, and then we're going to let. We're still fighting about no, this. So, and this is so, it's so funny. Like, this is. <laughs> If we're like, oh, we're like hashtag relationship goals. This was our first and like fight on the amazing race. So from my perspective, I I Wait. I grew up in Florida. I've gone ocean kayaking. I mean, I'm not professional. I'm not going to enter a competition, but I can kayak. Okay, I can, and I have you know you and I have gone kayaking together. Yep. Um, but the physics of it is, if you're you're six foot five and mostly torso you're leaning back off the back of the boat with and you're trying to do this and we were you were like okay i'm steering us we were going in the freaking trees i'm like babe you were not steering us just stop and you're like no i'm helping i'm helping i'm like just stop rowing and so at when you stopped rowing when you stopped rowing i got us most of the way there and then you were able to jam the hernia back in. And then by the time you see us, we're both rowing. And it yeah. was like merrily, merrily up a stream. Uh, thank you for getting us there. <laughs> I, I appreciate you helping me out when I was having a hernia. <laughs> a medical uh, condition. Everything else out of Kim's mouth is fake news. Um, <gasps> no, so, no. You were, you were like, I'm helping. You were like, I was really helping. Steer steering I am an us excellent into I am an excellent canoeist and kayakist. I understand the <laughs> physics of it very well. Thank you for mansplaining that to me. Thank you for putting Florida in your bona fides. That's great. That's awesome. We, we're surrounded Florida. by water. We're water people. That makes people. you an Olympic kayaker. Congratulations. I, I Okay. If we went into the history <laughs> of our life, how I, I put my kayak experience over yours. I know you're an Absolutely Eagle Scout. Absolutely not. No, I, I, I took like an, I, I did one of those kind of how good are they things when I was in Grand Junction, Colorado, and I can do like an actual roll in a kayak if you need me to. The bottom line is we were using kayak motions on a non-kayak boat. It was like a big fat raft. And what we really need were basic oars. Like if we had had canoe oars, we would have gotten there in two seconds because this boat behaved like a canoe. It was, it was wider wide. than a traditional kayak. It was, you're, right. you're, so, yeah. So we weren't really set up for success. If you watch Ryan and Dusty, who got off of that thing like someone had just given them 75 pounds of steroids and connected <laughs> it directly to their veins, or at least or at least Dusty was, they were rowing in the method that I wanted to. Now, I admit it was not ideal that I was laying flat on my back. So when I stopped, it probably was better. And thank you again for what you did. But I know how to paddle a freaking kayak. I didn't say and, yeah. you didn't know how. It kind of Welcome to our marriage. Or woman explained it to me, whatever it's um, yeah. I didn't anyway, say. So, so can, if, I, can I jump in one more time and just say how we resolved this that was not on any of the videos? And I want to thank you. We were heightening into an argument that we just had right now. We just had the same argument right now. And I threw out like, I'm doing it right. Leave me alone. Bip, bip, bop. I'm having a hernia. I was obviously cranky. There was like a two and a half second beat. And you said, let's not do this now. We're not doing this right now. And that was the end. And that was the end because it's until it's, right now, until right now. And it's just, it's, <laughs> it's comedy. Cause it's such a stupid thing to fight about. But I knew 
um, the perce- you you did you did think that you were helping. Oh my God! Let's not do this now, okay? <laughs> I'm going to say it this time. Let's not do this now. <laughs> Combined age, we are the oldest participants on this race. I mean, um, Arun is older and it's older than we are, but Natalia kind of brings his average down. And these are the things where you feel your age, right? Like you feel yeah. your age in this experience. Um, and but we got there. We are in first place. I was so proud of us. Um, the kids last night were very, like every week they think we're going to get eliminated. And so they were really shocked that we won a leg. We walked off the mat and we're like, oh, they're not even going to show us in this episode. It's going to be all about Ryan and Dusty. And, and Phil, in the, in the extra footage you see, you know, Phil's like, oh, Ryan and Dusty are behind. I was like, we were both like, oh, they're fine. They're, they're going to be fine. But we walked off like, they're, they're not even going to mention us in this episode because Ryan and Dusty not being in first place for the first time is going to be the storyline. And it kind of was, which is fine. But from our perspective, you know, you know, you walk away, you, you know, you can have a drink and get, you know, we collected our bags. We were sitting in the sun. We were just like, huh, like, and I'm like new Kim is enjoying herself. And a little while later you hear just screaming down by yeah, the it river. Sounded like fun. It sounded, and I, we were like, can we go? And the producers were like, no, you can't go down there. Um, you I, just heard just wild screaming because people came in like one right after the other. And it must have been just like panic inducing. And thank God we weren't in that mix because, you know, old Henry Hernia here, like, I don't think I could have wrote us Henry that fast. Hernia. Um, but the funniest part, and I had to rewind it three times, was like Ryan and Dusty taking off their life jackets. And Raquel and Kayla, like, kind of, like, like making fun of them with the, with the greeter guy, like making like, oh yeah, that was. That summed it up pretty well. That was um, they, the funniest part of the show. I'm, I'm going to throw this out there. That wasn't the first time Ryan and Dusty have taken their shirts off. Um, <sighs> I, it may be the first time that you guys have seen it as viewers, but, and I look, if I were Ryan and Dusty, I would walk around with my shirt off at church. I would do it. Every, I would do it literally. They, those guys had phenomenal bodies. It's funny. I have my shirt off in this show because I had to like move into a wetsuit. They put exactly one frame of it on there. Honey, I think you have like, a great body. Like, I'm into it. Uh, uh, not, I mean, like, uh, thank you. you, but everything is relative. I think if like, like on this trip right now with a bunch of 50 year old men, like I'm probably, <laughs> GQ. I don't know, like 65th percentile, but like not on that race. No, those guys were freaking rip city. Um, but, yeah. I mean, like nobody was complaining that they were taking off their life jackets. It was just like a funny no. time to do it. Um, yeah. And I remember seeing them after I'm like, are they naked? Like, what did they do with their clothes? I will say also something we, the first time we left on the race, we brought two pair of sneakers because I was like, I don't want to wet shoes. And what if we, you hear people losing shoes, but this time, instead of bringing another pair of sneakers, we brought water shoes. So in the clue, it said, and poor Lulu and Lala, they didn't read this part. Cause like, let me tell you though, like reading the clue is like harder than you would think. Like you're in just the adrenaline's going and like, it is harder than you think to like, Race read. Blinders. Race yeah, blinders. you like you just, so you had to leave everything in that you'd be canoeing. So we put on our water shoes. So we like didn't have wet feet. I was so proud of us. So they show a very dramatic ending and then they show poor Sherry and Akbar who were like, it was, it was really close between that big group and Sherry and Akbar. Yeah. And again, we had had the opportunity to travel so closely with these people. And, you know, in the 19 month break, you like learn about people. So we were, I was gen, like genuinely sad. I mean, not like, not that you want anybody to go home and it's a race and a contest, I get it. But like, I was genuinely sad that they, like, we didn't see them come up. Um, it was really, and we're, we are going to interview them. Penn is in a different spot. I'm in charge of the electronics and I didn't trust myself to get them in on zoom. And I wanted to devote some time to them and their story. So, and I wanted it to be good. So we're going to have them on the podcast and an upcoming podcast. Yeah. yeah I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just add on to that. Uh, Akbar, uh, was a former basketball player. He and I share a lot of similar interests off of the race. Mm-hmm. I mean, not only, not only are both of them just great people and human beings and their story, I hope people get to hear more about their story and not just about their relationship on the race. But we were, as we were traveling through these countries, we would meet up near or on the plains. There's no Wi-Fi. There's no phones. There's really no way to entertain. There's no TV except, in the back of the thing. Yeah. yeah. 
Right, right. And so we, Akbar and I, were each other's sports center. Oh my God, it was so we, funny. We, so we would just sit there and for talk hours about sports and like, talk about sports. Like we would rank our top players in the NBA and we would talk about what's wrong with the, you know, Akbar had his theories about what was wrong with the NBA now. I had my own theories. We talked about college basketball. Oh my God. And Sherry and I would be like, oh, yep, still talking. Let's go back over here. Like we want to know part of it. I, I will say, you know, yeah. Akbar and Sherry. Akbar specifically got a lot of heat just in like the language he was using. And then on the Zoom call last night, I mean, you know, Sherry said it. Listen, the race is like this much of a 20 year marriage and it wasn't necessarily a bright spot, but they love each other very deeply. And as Sherry said last night, she was like a 20 year marriage doesn't happen by accident and it, it not ideal right to see like he but in you see moments of like when she did the bungee jump how proud he was of her and like how they wanted to work together but in those moments of like intense stress the a different sort of language like he's he was even saying last night like when they play cards together they are very competitive with each other like not every marriage is super schmoopy like ours and so they and they're very competitive with each other and that's just kind of like the language they use in those competitive situations and like do I get to judge that? No. So, um, and he's doing incredible things. He has a new book coming out. He's like a really, he's saving people's lives in his community. So, um, and she's, um, you know, also there's been some criticism like, oh, why didn't they get in, you know, better shape? The 19 month, you listen to that. I, I want people to hear their story. The 19 months of this pandemic, you know, Penn and I were super busy. You know, I know it's like, we do this like weird influencer thing, but we do a lot of work behind the scenes for companies. We um, like an, in a marketing firm. And so we do this like weird influencer thing, but we also work for and with other people. So we work over 40 hours a week, but we can create our own schedule and we never work weekends. So like we had the ability to train and do stuff. Sherry and Akbar had never been busier. And right. so this was like the hardest time of their life. So the, them just like dropping to like go train with kettlebells up a mountain like it's just not gonna it, work but no matter yeah no matter what they had trained for akbar's knees uh like I, I i've got bad knees and he like we talked about this a lot too we talked about our knees his knees and his weight were never gonna like that his waterloo was that mountain it's yeah. just it, it was not good for people's knees i could feel the strain on mine and i mean no matter how many mountains he'd walked up or down that just may not have been possible for his body yeah and and i, I felt for him too so there's a tweet from andrea Trantham, uh, you don't have to be fun, Kim. We love you for being the kick-ass boss you already are. Thanks, Andrea. <laughs> new Kim. It's ex. Yeah, <laughs> it's so exhausting. New Kim was. Yeah, new Kim was pretty interesting to me, and there was like one kind of un unintended side effect of it, and I think it was a positive side effect. But when you started chilling out, um, and I didn't have to drive, we've talked about this before just the two of us. And I think we talked about it in the hotel room afterwards. It kind of gave me a chance to tinker with the attention to detail pen, which guys, nobody really has met before. Right. Does anyone no. know attention to detail pen? No, you guys. And so oh, we can also talk about in the roadblock, you had to find a clue under a waterfall. So I knew you were physically capable, but I'm like, my ADHD husband is going to be like, this is so amazing. I've never seen something beautiful. And then like passed by a clue, but you found it. And then I love you for it. You saw us with the mule and it was an intent attention to detail thing. Like there were some straps. I think it probably, we did it very quickly and it took us about 20 ish minutes. Um, and there was like all these straps, but pen was the one that was like, no, the knot's like this. And Penn was the one that noticed like, oh, it goes this way. And so attention to detail, can, like when you didn't have to babysit my emotions, <laughs> <laughs> you're like attention. I was, and I, you guys, if you are new here, welcome. If you've been around for a minute, you realize that like Penn leaves keys in the refrigerator. I one time opened, I found like the milk in the, like, cupboard where like the coffee mugs go like he just it's an adhd thing like attention to detail has like not been a strength but here no. on this day it was or so yeah um and that was i mean i think you you nailed it right there it's your brain has so much space mm -hmm. right it's like looking at a computer when you have that activity monitor up mm -hmm. and you're like why isn't my 
you know, why isn't my internet working? It's because it's got 90% on some, you know, app that you didn't realize was open and you got to shut that app down. Yeah. I think everyone's brain works like that as well. And first of all, I want to tell you, like, I love babysitting your emotions. It is, it is normally Good, you're stuck a part. With me. Well, it makes me feel useful. You know, it, it, it's, you are such a force to be reckoned with when you're running properly. Um, and, uh, and, you know, sometimes when you have a break from that, like other things can work their way in. Just like for you, if you're not having to pick up after my crap all the time and I try to, you know, kind of clean up around and get your headspace more even keeled, like you can perform better. So that I feel like that's something that we not only subconsciously, but actually consciously started talking about during the race. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, I, I love new Kim. I also love old Kim. I think they both need to be there. But as we said at the beginning of this podcast, it was how you reassociated with yeah. everything that was going on around you. And it was the, the most positive I think serene way to do it. And I, I like it, it, it was so obvious that you were just willing your way into it, which is just goes to show like what a strong will you have as a human being. Well, thank you. And it really did. I mean, it, it, people have asked us like, how did the amazing race change you as a person? And I wanted to wait until this moment to talk about it is mm -hmm. that from that day on in those tough moments. And it's, if only if you live with anxiety and depression do you know what i'm talking about because we have full-time jobs we have two very busy kids like i there are days where i sit and like pull the covers over my head but you can't like you can't do that yeah. and we had we had purposely put ourselves in a situation that was way out of our comfort zone so i needed to pretend to be the kind of person that was good at that <laughs> and so now i do that in my daily life now like if i'm having a really tough day i have to say to myself what would a person without anxiety do? Well, this, and then I have like, what would a person without depression do? A person without anxiety and depression would go on a walk. A person without anxiety and depression would take a shower. Like I have to pretend and then slowly I kind of, you know, it, you start getting into the flow and momentum can take over and you can have a, a proper work day and you can be, you can cook dinner for your family and you can laugh at the dinner table. So it's, it feels a little inauthentic in the beginning, but now that, you know, mm -hmm. this, this day in particular, in this moment, I think we needed to struggle with that whole like bungee jump and me getting lost at, like if I had not struggled so hard afterwards, I don't think I would have come to this realization. And for that, like in that way, the race was a really big gift to me. Somebody said, oh, you know, what was that? That, that chartered flight looks super fan fancy. What's the deal with that? Yes, I think we talked about that. It was very fancy. Um, but again, we d I think <laughs> it was hard for me to like let go of uh, not knowing where we were going. We were really prepared to come into this race like in airports, like the questions to add, like I had memorized the questions we were going to research if we got access to a computer, which is like, you know, find out the country you're going to and like capital cities, the sports they played, their flags, you know, their foods, their customs, like all these things. So I could be more mentally prepared. We were literally mm -hmm. landing and asking the immigration person, where are we? Like, what are we doing? IV says CBS should do a limited series showing the behind the scenes of making a season of the amazing race uh, for over 30 seasons. I've wanted to know the work the production team does in making the great, com greatest competition series in TV history. Yeah. We, let me let me jump in on this one. Yeah, we've pitched that a thousand times. <laughs> yes, so we are we are a production company, as you know. There is nothing more fancy, uh, fascinating than what goes on behind the scenes. I do believe that they've discussed that as well. And the only thing I'm not going to speak for anyone on any production side um, or any of the leadership there. All I can say is the environment that they have created and the safety net that they have created around their racers over 33 seasons. And the devotion and the professionalism of everyone from producers to audio people to photographers would be fascinating. I feel I, I think it would be like a Ted Lasso feel good story. Well, thank you for uh, watching and subscribing and liking and sharing and all the things um, for this podcast. I know you have to go because you have to come back and see me. Yes. Okay. Bye. I, I love I miss you. you. Um, I, I love what you've done with the place. I love how you got the paintings <laughs> or the pictures started behind you. And I'm just going to say this. And I'm, I've always wanted to do this because I can leave the meeting right after. I'm a better kayaker than you are. Stop it. No, you're not. Oh, well, I'm still recording. Ha ha ha.
I'm still recording. Welcome to my solo podcast now where I talk about how my husband was literal dead weight. Dead weight on the back of the kayak. Me, Kim Holderness, got us like 75% of the way there. I was like, just stop paddling. He thinks he's so funny because he left the meeting. This is my TED Talk, guys. This is my moment. Anyway, thanks for watching.